We want to begin by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva and Keech Nation peoples and their neighbors from north to south, the Chumash, Tataviam, Katanamuk, Sorano, Kawia, Peom Kuichum, Mahashaman, Ipai Tipai, Kumyai, and the Ketchan peoples whose ancestors ruled the region we now called Southern California for at least 9,000 years. Indigenous stewardship and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished nor legally extinguished. We pay respects to the members and the elders of these communities, past and present, who remain caretakers and advocates of the lands, river systems, and the waters and islands of the Santa Barbara Channel. For a more detailed land acknowledgement, authored by the USC Van Hunnick Department of History, we invite you to visit their website. And my colleague Maya will put that into the chat for those of you joining us on Zoom. Uh, we'd love to know where our Zoom audience is joining us from, so feel free to let us know in the chat. I was in there earlier looking at where people are from um, and saw some familiar names. Thank you for joining us. If you want to know what indigenous territory you're on, um, my colleague Maya will also put a link to that in the chat so you can explore that. So my name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director of the USC Dorn Site Center for Advanced Genocide Research. And on behalf of the center and the USC Shoah Foundation, who are jointly presenting today's lecture, I'm delighted to welcome you, those of you in person, Please get more tacos, we have many. <laughs> and those of you joining us on Zoom, this is our first, the center's first event of the fall semester, and we have a lively and full calendar of events coming up, including a couple more uh, organized by the Shoah Foundation. So we hope you'll join us for those. Just a couple of notes about the Zoom protocols for those of you joining us online. Right now, you're viewing a side-by-side -side of the speaker and the slides, and I just want to make you aware that you can make either window larger or smaller by dragging the dividing line between the windows. Um, so if Clara has, is staying on a slide for a long time and you want a close-up of her, you can just drag to make either window bigger or smaller. We will have time for questions and discussion at the end of Clara's lecture, so we invite and encourage, um, obviously, questions from those of you in the room and also on Zoom using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. And my colleague Maya will read the questions from the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can and apologies in advance if we can't get to all of them. And just so you're aware, we always share all of the questions with our speakers so they can know the kinds of questions that their talk has stimulated. So now to introduce today's speaker, I'm very pleased to turn things over to the founding director of the USC Dorn Site Center for Advanced Genocide Research, Chappelle Guerin Chair in Jewish Studies and Professor of History at USC, Wolf Gruner. Wolf? Thank you so much, uh, Martha, and uh, also thank Maya and our graduate assistant Charlotte for preparing and uh, the organization here and also our partners at the Shoah Foundation. Um, just uh, a few words about uh, the fellowship which uh, brought uh, Clara here from uh, the UK to uh, sunny Los Angeles. Finally, it's sunny again. <laughs> um, so the USC Shoah Foundation Robert J. Katz Research Fellowship in Genocide Studies uh, is named after a longtime volunteer and former USC Shaw Foundation Board of Counselors, uh, Chair Robert J. Katz, in recognition of his service to the USC Shaw Foundation. The fellowship is awarded annually to an outstanding, advanced standing PhD candidate from any discipline for dissertation research focused on testimony from the USC Shaw Foundation Visual History Archive and other unique USC resources like the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Collection 
The Katz Fellowship enables the recipient to spend one month uh, in residence at the USC Dawn Self Center for Advanced Genocide Research and the USC Shaw Foundation during the academic year. The USC Dawn Self Center for Advanced Genocide Research was founded in 2014 and concentrates its effort uh, on developing an innovative interdisciplinary research agenda focusing mainly on three distinct areas, resistance to genocide and mass violence, violence, emotion and behavioral change, and uh, digital genocide studies. As Marta already mentioned, uh, we have a lively academic uh, program. Uh, we hold it each year an international conference. The next one is coming up in two weeks. We co-organize a PhD conference, an international conference with Yad Vashem and uh, Clark University in October. Um, we are hosting numerous fellows as Clara uh, and also visiting scholars uh, and we organize um, workshops and other uh, things. So uh, this year or this semester is especially important because it leads up to our 10th anniversary and next year will be a very important uh, year not just because we celebrate 10 years but much more because we will host two uh, enormous big conferences at USC as the center. One is um, the International Network of Genocide Scholars will be here uh, having the annual con uh, biannual convention and then at the end of the year we will host co-host um, Lessons and Legacies, the biggest Holocaust uh, studies conference uh, internationally. Uh, the USC Shaw Foundation, our, par uh, our partner here, uh, was founded in 1994. Uh, the mission is to develop empathy, understanding and respect through testimony. Uh, the Institute's efforts are rooted in the Visual History Archive, the main repository containing over 55,000 testimonies of survivors and witnesses to genocide and other crimes against humanity. Their program focus uh, is on preserving and expanding the testimony collections, the uh, education through uh, strategic partnerships, the research on history and prevention of genocide, and the global outreach through compelling stories from the Visual History Archive. After all this, I'm finally come to introduce <laughs> what I actually should do, is uh, to really, uh, and this is uh, kind of also sad because it's almost the last days here, to welcome Clara as the uh, this year's Katz Fellow. She is a third year PhD candidate in history at Christ College at the University of Cambridge in uh, the United Kingdom. She earned her master in modern European history at the rival, I would say, <laughs> at <laughs> Oxford, uh, University of Oxford, where she uh, was awarded in this distinction for her uh, master's thesis. And also she uh, actually followed this up uh, because she also got her BA at uh, Oxford, um, also with honors, uh, I have to say. Her dissertation research is uh, currently, I would say, titled The Internment of the Family Jews and Roma in Dancy, Poitiers, and Montreux, Villet, from uh, 1939 to 1946. And uh, this uh, research is uh, 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 supported not only by the Katz Fellowship, but uh, especially by the Open Oxford Cambridge <coughs> H AHRC doctoral trainee program and the GH Plump Studentship at Christ College. Uh, it's interesting, this is uh, a, a kind of a part of a collaborative uh, endeavor um, uh, which is titled The Romani Holocaust and its Aftermath in Gender's Perspective, where this PhD is done in collaboration with the Wiener Library, um, the Wiener Holocaust Library, I have to say, in London. She works uh, there uh, alongside her PhD as a dig digital education officer, uh, organ and she recently organized uh, a groundbreaking international symposium on new research uh, regarding the Roma genocide. She also was a co-organizer of a workshop for early career Holocaust scholars on the benefits, challenges, and issues that arise when uh, we work with letters as a primary source uh, in Holocaust research. Um, she has uh, extensive experience in writing uh, because she worked for a lot of newspapers, student newspapers at Oxford, but also uh, local and uh, uh, kind of uh, national magazines like the Frontrunner magazine, uh, City A&M, and the Private Equity Wire. I don't um, she can explain this. <laughs> so, uh, um, so we are really honored to have her here and to, to uh, that she will share her research with us. 
Um, after this fellowship at the Center at the Shaw Foundation, um, Clara will go to a complete a junior fellowship at the Neon Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. Uh, so please give a warm hand uh, and welcome. Her. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all very much for being here in person and online. I'm incredibly grateful to the USC Shaw Foundation and the USC Center for Advanced Genocide Research for awarding me this fellowship and for giving me the opportunity to come to USC and engage with both a fascinating range of sources and researchers. Um, I want to especially thank Wolf Gruner, Martha Stroud, and Charlotte Gibbs for being so kind and welcoming and for making my stay at the center such a wonderful time. I know I'm going to find it very hard to leave USC and not because of the amazing weather. Um, <laughs> so today I'd like to speak about this notion of entangled history and how it has shaped my research into Jewish and Roma families' experiences in France using the Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, which from now on I'll refer to as the VHA. So I'm going to argue that the history of Jews and Roma in France between 1940 and 1946 is entangled because the experiences of the two groups were in many ways similar and interrelated, and also because the sources we have available to study their experiences are interlinked. Um, so first, I'd quickly like to make a note on some of the terms I'll be using in this talk. Throughout, I'm going to be using the term Roma, but um, with the knowledge that this is very much an imperfect denomination, it homogenizes and essentializes the diversity of different groups present in France during the Second World War um, and that are still present there today. This includes the Rome, the Gitans of Hispanic origin, and the Sinti, more often referred to as Manouche in France. The term Roma is also not one usually used by researchers in France, nor one that was used to refer to these groups at the time, um, but I'm going to be using it today because I'm doing this presentation in English and it's just easier. Um, the current preferred term used by French researchers when speaking about the perse this persecution is nomad, um, which is the name that the French administration used at the time and that was used to persecute different groups due to their supposedly itinerant lifestyle. Um, this definition was very approximate and improperly applied and reflected the reluctance of the French state to use racialized language despite a clearly racially charged undertone. Um, Tsingen is another term often used to refer to the Roma in France, both by researchers and also by Jewish survivors um, in a lot of these testimonies when speaking about Roma in French camps, so I will quote it at times. Um, despite its shared linguistic origin with the German term Zigeuner, Tsingen is generally less controversial as a term and more widely used. Um, and finally, a note on the term gypsy. This is a very pejorative and derogatory term to use when speaking of the Roma people, um, and I'll only be using it in this talk when I'm directly quoting testimonies that were given in English where survivors do use it. Um, so I'm going to provide some brief context on what was going on in France between 1940 and 1946 for those of who, you who might be less familiar with this history. Um, so France was at war with Germany until June 1940 when an armistice was signed. After that, the country was split into two zones, which you can see here, the occupied zone in the north, um, which was administered directly by the Nazi administration, and the unoccupied zone in the south um, under the authority of a new French government. This government was colloquially known as the Vichy government and was theoretically independent, but in reality collaborated with the Nazis to implement Nazi policies, the main one being the persecution of France's Jewish population, but also France's Roma population. From the autumn of 1940, in both the occupied and the unoccupied zone, um, both zones were subject to anti-Semitic measures, which targeted foreign Jews, but also Jews who had been in France for generations. From 1942 onwards, Jews began to be arrested and detained in prison camps, also known as internment camps across the country, before being deported to concentration and extermination camps in the East. Over 76,000 Jews were deported from French internment camps between 1940 and 1945, um, 70,000 of them to Auschwitz, and only about 2,000 returned. Though the persecution of France's Roma population intensified after the Nazis occupied the country, um, it's important to note that the French state had a much more long-term history of persecuting Roma through xenophobic policies. From 1912, um, Roma were required to carry identification cards with their fingerprints and their photographs, um, which is very similar to measures in Germany at the time. In 1939, their ability to circulate in France was also heavily restricted, and the state began to round up Roma families and place them under house arrest. Um, they began to be imprisoned in internment camps in France from 1941 on the orders of the Nazi occupying authorities. 
Though there was no systematic policy of deporting Roma from France to death camps, we know that at least two convoys left France, deporting them in 1943, uh, most likely to Auschwitz, Dachau, and Buchenwald. It's been estimated that over 600,000 individuals were impri imprisoned in French camps throughout the occupation. Most of these prisoners were Jewish, but approximately 6,500 were Roma, the majority of whom were French nationals. Over 200 different prison camps existed in France, all administered and guarded by the French police, crucially, um, who were known as the gendarmes. So today, I'm going to be focusing on four different camps where both Jews and Roma were imprisoned, and you can see them on the map here of several of them in red. Um, Poitiers, Rivesalt, Agde, and argelès sur mer um, Poitiers was located in the northern occupied zone, you can see here, and the others were in the southern zone. Um, these camps had often been built in a rush and were made up of makeshift wooden barracks surrounded by barbed wire, as you can see in these photos. Um, men, women, and children were mixed in the barracks and slept on straw mats on the floor. Um, there was no privacy, sanitary, and health conditions were generally very poor, and disease spread quickly. The food rations were extremely inadequate. Um, prisoners also had very little contact with the outside world and were only occasionally allowed to send and receive mail, but this was very limited and often subject to censorship. Researchers have generally seen the experiences of Jews and Roma during this time as separate. Um, some have argued that studying the two together involves making equivalences with the hindsight of a historian instead of reflecting the reality of the time. Arguments have also been made that trying to compare the experiences of Jews and Roma in the Holocaust enters into unproductive discussions of who had it worse and involves placing different victim groups in a kind of hierarchy of suffering. Um, so I'm aiming to show that these experiences should be discussed in relation to each other and as entangled without getting into discussions of competitive victimhood because in France, Jews and Roma did clearly have shared experiences of persecution and especially in French camps. In these camps, they were imprisoned in separate sections, but usually only separated by one barbed wire fence. Um, if we look at these photos taken here, for example, in the camp of Poitiers, the one on the left is of a Jewish family in front of some barbed wire and the second of a Roma family behind barbed wire. Um, so this is how Jews and Roma would have seen each other from either side of the camps. They were therefore able to observe each other, form opinions on each other's behavior, and at times even able to interact. And I argue that all this made them witnesses to each other's persecution and internment. Um, so I set out on this path of research in the VHA and the Shell Foundation, knowing that according to the online indexing, there was only one testimony from a Roma persecutee who had been detained in French camps in the collection, and over 500 from Jews detained in similar camps. Um, I thought maybe I'd be able to uncover some more testimonies from French Roma that maybe hadn't been indexed properly, but I quickly discovered this wasn't the case. There really was only one testimony that directly spoke to the Roma experience in France, um, though it's important to know that there are over 400 that speak to the experience of Roma in Russia and Ukraine mostly. Um, this source disparity between Jewish and Roma sources isn't an unusual situation for an archive relating to the study of genocide and the Holocaust, and unfortunately part of a more general issue of a lack of adequate sources available to write the history of the persecution of France's Roma population. Um, so that immediately presented me with a challenge, um, how to write a relational history of interactions, mutual perceptions, and linked experiences of Jews and Roma with such a source of um, inequality and disparity. So when using the VHA, I realized that if I wanted to look specifically at internment in France and try to understand um, what Roma prisoners lived through as well as Jewish prisoners, I would actually need to use Jewish testimonies um, on camps where both Roma and Jews were imprisoned and comb them for clues on the Roma experience. So in this sense, the study of Jews and Roma in France becomes entangled due to the disparity of sources available, and my research became a study that was much more about one-sided perceptions between Jews and Roma and less mutual, and therefore in a way much more unequal. Um, this inequality in the sources available to us to study the persecution of these two groups is something that has recently become much more discussed in historiography, especially with um, Professor Ari Joskovich's recent book, Reign of Ash, Roma Jews and the Holocaust, which I really recommend to anyone who's interested in the subject. His research focuses on this entanglement of um, sources and knowledge production on the genocide of Jews and Roma in Europe, though his focus is much less on France and more on Germany. Um, so I'd like to start now by going, uh, talking a bit more in depth about the one testimony from a French Roma held in the DHA. Um, this testimony was given by Chinga Tanesh on the 29th of June, 1997. 
Um, Tiga was born in December 1938 in a small village in the north of France. He was first arrested um, with his family by the French police in 1940 um, and brought to the camp of Poitiers that I spoke about earlier and then to a different camp called Montreuil de la, which is a lot smaller. Um, here is a photo from his testimony and next to it is a photo that he showed during his interview um, that was taken when he was in the camp of Montreuil de la. So he is the young boy on the bottom right here. Um, he's standing with his mother and his aunts, I believe, um, and he's standing behind the barbed wire. So in this last camp, he was separated from his mother, um, whose name was Rosa, and she was deported out of the camp in 1943. Rosa was transferred to a different prison camp in Belgium and then taken alone to another camp further north in France and then deported um, to Auschwitz and killed there on the 15th of January, 1944. Um, Ziga was still a child then, and he was taken alone to a different camp and then deported to the concentration camps in east of France called Metzweiler Schutthof and then Dachau and Auschwitz, um, where he was the subject of several medical experiments. He survived and was liberated by the Soviets there in January 1945. So this testimony is really fascinating um, to better understand the experiences of Roma in French camps. It shows how Roma families were often shifted from one camp to the next, um, at times remaining in certain camps for only a few months. Ziga also described the internal hierarchies present in some of the camps between different groups that the French government persecuted as nomads, quote unquote, um, between those who were nomadic merchants, and in his words, more normal, versus his family and others who were perceived as more folkloric. He explained that charities that came to the camp to give free clothes to the prisoners did not give them to him and his family, but did to other prisoners, um, including Jewish prisoners. His testimony also shows that Roma individuals in the camps were organized by a family, with a male head of the family um, in charge of making sure all the members of the family showed up to the daily roll call, and that the family had enough water for the day. Um, this testimony also speaks to how a Roma individual experienced being interned alongside Jews. Um, while describing the layout of the camp in Poitiers, he spoke about the interactions he had with other Jewish prisoners um, throughout his time there, mostly through doing chores in the camp, despite the fact that they were separated by this barbed wire. Um, finally, this testimony sheds light on the still very under-researched um, deportation of Roma from France, which is a further way in which the experiences of Jews and Roma in France could be seen to be entangled. Though deportation most likely, we're not entirely sure on the numbers, but affected a few hundred Roma. They would have been deported from camps where they were interned alongside Jews and in train convoys in the same carriages as Jews. Ziga's case is very unique in the sense that he was a very young child who somehow survived multiple different concentration and extermination camps. Um, in his testimony, he also speaks about the skepticism he sometimes faces when recounting his story. Um, the prisoner number tattooed on his arm is not recorded in any of the existing archives of Auschwitz, Dachau, or Netzwader Schutthof. This could be due to many reasons. Um, the archives of these camps are in no way complete, and gaps exist in many of the prisoner records. And the fact um, that he was so young at the time could also have something to do with his presence not being well recorded. The only record I managed to find um, was the record of his mother being deported to Auschwitz. So these gaps in the archives um, are all the more indicative of the importance of drawing on testimonies to understand the experiences of French Roma that have not yet been properly recorded or analyzed, only recently starting to be acknowledged in the public realm. Um, additionally, only working with one testimony to speak of Roma internment in France brings up the question of uniqueness versus representativeness. This testimony does not reflect the trajectories of most Roma in France who were not deported, but remained imprisoned in camps until 1946, two years after the end of the war and the end of the Nazi occupation. Um, this account reflects some of the issues present when using testimonies in the VHA more broadly. The fact that many of the interviewees were young children at the time that they were having these experiences, so their stories are not always told in the most linear or clear way. Um, Ziga was only four years old when his, he was first imprisoned in a camp. And at times when listening to his um, testimony, it's kind of hard to follow his and his family's exact trajectory through various camps or the dates of deportations or transfers. It's also not really clear um, why this is the only testimony of a French Roma in the VHA. His interviewer was a French journalist um, named Edith Gombos Sohel. She also conducted several other interviews with French Jews, but also witnesses to persecution. And the only thing really connecting all of these and this testimony is the fact that they were carried out in or around Paris. 
Um, I also had a look at the pre-interview questionnaire that interviews, interviewers were made to fill out. And the only comments she made are a slightly cryptic note on the fact that the interview was carried out in Zigaz Caravan, and that therefore, I quote, the crow of roosters and noises from other animals, such as monkeys and dogs, are inevitably a part of the interview, end quote. Um, so I've shown here that the VHA is limited in terms of the amount of material it contains on the persecution of Roma in France, but like I said earlier, this archival limitation is not unique to the VHA and can be seen in many other archives used to study the Holocaust in terms of a lack of testimonies from French Roma. Um, more generally, it's also just difficult to find material on the persecution of Roma in France in contrast with a wealth of material on the persecution of Jews. Um, this is mainly because the persecution of Roma in France was not the subject of any substantial scholarly research until the last two decades. Um, and it has significantly increased in the last five years, again in contrast with the plight of Jews in France. Testimony collection on the Holocaust in the 1990s did not focus on the experiences of Roma in France. Um, and the only concerted large-scale effort to collect testimonies on the persecution of French Roma took place very recently from 2019 to 2022, um, with over 250 testimonies collected. And that's a very exciting project. Um, the lack of academic research on the subject also obviously reflects a lack of wider societal recognition of the persecution and the persistence of xenophobia against Roma in France. Um, the French state only publicly recognized the role that it played in the persecution and imprisonment of Roma in 2016, so very recently. Um, the existence of larger archives relating to the fate of Jews in France, such as the Shoah Memorial Foundation in Paris, has also made the centralization of documentation on Jews much easier, especially personal family documents as well as testimonies, and a lack of a real centralized archive pertaining to the fate of Roma in France uh, makes it a lot more challenging to find these types of documents that allow for an understanding of um, Roma experiences through their own voices. Additionally, many sources on the persecution of the Roma are contained in archives that focus on the persecution of Jews, such as the Paris Show Memorial Foundation, which kind of perpetuates this unequal relationship. Um, so this situation of a lack of testimonies of French Roma meant that while doing research um, in the VHA, I chose to turn to Jewish testimonies for details of how Roma families lived in these internment camps. The first crucial challenge I faced is the extent to which testimonies in the VHA and testimonies more generally as sources um, are shaped not only by what the interviewee say says, but also what the interviewer is looking for. Um, this last month was my first time really engaging in depth with a large number of testimonies and I realized how frustrating it can be when an interviewer doesn't address the questions that you as a researcher, <laughs> seeing a lot of nods in the room, <laughs> that you as a researcher want answers to. Um, Roma prisoners are only mentioned in a select few testimonies out of all the interviews of Jews in camps where both Roma and Jews were imprisoned. Only eight out of 32 interviews contain mentions of Roma prisoners beyond a mere cursory mention of their presence in the camps. In many of these testimonies, if the interviewee does refer to Roma individuals, it's generally when asked about their first impression of the camp, and they usually just say that the camp was separated into two, one side for Jews, one side for Roma, and they don't go into any more detail than that. So in all the testimonies I watched relating to Jews interned in French camps where Roma were also interned, um, I also found I only found one case where an interviewer asked a direct question about other Roma prisoners. Um, a man named Alberto Leon, who was interned in the camp of Rivesalt, mentioned that he had seen, I quote, gypsies in the camp, and the interviewer just followed up by asking, what do you remember about the gypsies? Um, in no other case did an interviewer actually ask a direct question about Roma prisoners, and in one interview um, that I found with a woman named Bella Ulfeder on her time in Poitiers, the interviewer actually interrupted her when she was speaking about Roma prisoners in the camp to ask her a separate question about who was enforcing the separation between different prisoner groups. Um, this lack of interest in the experience of Roma in French camps in Jewish testimonies is most likely shaped by the fact that most of these interviews were conducted in the mid to late 90s. Um, as I mentioned before, the experience of Roma in France wasn't really the subject of research until the last two decades, and even now is very much still confined to researchers only within France. Um, the focus of all the questions and the testimonies that I've watched are much more on questions of um, French versus German authority over the camps, who was guarding Jewish prisoners, and what the food and sanitary conditions were. The second big challenge of using um, Jewish testimonies to uncover Roma experiences is that when Jewish interviewees do speak of Roma prisoners, their accounts are often clouded by stereotypical imagery and prejudice, 
regarding Roma that existed at the time, um, both in France and in Europe more generally. A widespread association of Roma with illegality and social marginality in many of these testimonies makes it difficult to really reconstruct their experiences. Some of the main stereotypes that are drawn on revolve around um, notions of cleanliness. Here I'm going to quote a woman named Regine Pringle who was imprisoned in Poitiers. Um, when asked what she remembered about the Poitiers camp, she said, I quote, the extreme difference between the way the gypsy camp was kept and the way the Jewish camp was kept. They were, I guess you can say, filthy, very dirty, and the Jewish camp, on the other hand, went out of their way to keep the place clean. This obviously perpetuates existing stereotypes of Roma as unclean and also contradicts many other testimonies which speak of the general impossibility of keeping any part of the camp clean and the spread of lice, bed bugs, and disease through both the Jewish and Roma sections of the camp. Um, other Jewish interviewees also often express misguided perceptions that Roma in the camp were homeless and simply stayed in prison because they had nowhere else to go. Um, this again draws on stereotypes of vacancy and asociality and is in fact incorrect. Roma families were arrested by French police from 1939 onwards, forcibly taken from their caravans and had their possessions confiscated from them. Some Roma families had also been living in fixed accommodation, fixed houses for some years prior to the war and they too were arrested and sent to prison camps. The um, xenophobic stereotype of Roma as people who steal children also came up in some of these testimonies, including one by a Jewish woman named Alice Rosen, who was interned in Rivselt. She said, I quote, Rivselt had a section with gypsies. They imprisoned the gypsies too. And of course, there was always a story going around that if the gypsies find a child, they will keep it and sell it. Then one day I wandered away from my parents and wandered into the gypsy camp. They couldn't find me anywhere. I was lost. They were just petrified. And of course, the first thing they thought of was that I could have wandered into the gypsies where they found me. The comment here that Alice makes the, that, of course, this rumor was circulating reflects the extent to which she saw this image of the quote unquote thieving gypsy as normalized in her world and French society at the time. Perceptions of otherness and exoticism also shape many Jewish accounts of Roma experiences in French camps stereotypes that developed mostly in the 19th century um, with links made between Roma and more colonial imagery. Jewish interviewees focus on how different, how different Roma looked to them in the camps, and this elicited a certain kind of curiosity, especially from people who were um, young children in the camps. A woman named Ava Lang described the Roma she saw in the camp of Riefsel, saying, I quote, we always liked to run and see how the gypsies were living. It was something special for us to see, you know. For sure they were very dirty, but they were funny. For children it was funny to see. I remember their dances, they had very special clothes. I remember a young woman who supposedly had lots of lovers from the guards there. She had a lot of hair, you know, and those dresses. She had really dark hair and dark skin. She was even beautiful, marvelous. I remember that well. Here, Roma in the camp seemed to be received as a kind of attraction that children went to go see. Um, and this account also seems to be shaped um, by stereotypes about the promiscuity of Roma women with the description of this Roma woman and her letters. Um, what further emerges from these testimonies is a sense of resentment from Jews at being seen in a similar position to Roma prisoners, which again is tinged with a very xenophobic undertone. Um, Regine Lang, when speaking of Poitiers, said, I quote, the food supply that was given to gypsies had to do for us. Um, Ava Lang, when speaking of Riefselt, said, I quote, for my mother, that was devastation to be compared with gypsies. She comes from such a nice, educated family. It was really hard and humiliating for her especially. We didn't see it that way. We were children. It was fun for us in a certain way. Ava's mother saw her, quote, nice, educated background as something that should have differentiated her from the, quote, gypsies, and being imprisoned alongside them was a further humiliation, meaning she could not be compared to them. Um, some, though very few, Jewish testimonies go beyond stereotype visions of otherhood when speaking of Roma, and this often happens when interviewees are speaking of actual interactions between um, Jews and Roma, not just perceptions from afar. These often come with an acknowledgement that the similarly dire situation that Jews and Roma were both in in the camps, and the sense that this created um, a sense of understanding between them and overcame the perceived distance between the two groups. Topsia Barbanel, who was interned in Poitiers, spoke of how Jews helped Roma in the camp, but also how Roma helped Jews. Um, she said, the first day when we arrived at the camp, we were given our ration of bread. We saw outstretched hands from behind the barbed wire and we gave our bread to the Roma because we did not know we would also be hungry. She also said, and when the priest came to the Roma, they spoke to him of us. 
Here, Topia is speaking um, of this French priest, Father Fleury, who often visited the Roma in Poitiers, but who ultimately also helped Jews by helping trying to get younger Jewish children out of the camp. And she saw Roma as having something to do with this connection being made. Um, in a different interview, um, a man named Alex Halbrunner in Riefsel described how the shared experience of hunger caused tension between prisoners. He described an incident where a fight broke out between his brother and a Roma man over a bowl of soup, but he didn't express any resentment over the incident, saying, I quote, all this because we were hungry. That's what I remember the most. Jewish testimonies also reveal stories of Roma resourcefulness and resistance in different camps, um, especially in the south of France. In her testimony, Sophie Caplan um, described a rumor in the camp of Agde that the, quote, gypsies had set up a fire to protest the bad food they were being served. A similar story was told by a woman named Rita Sands in the camp of Algebes sur mer Rita said, I quote, those gypsies are pretty tough people. They were not afraid of anything. Somebody got wind that there were buried sacks of garbanzo beans in the ground of the kitchen for the black market. And we were just so hungry, it was a really horrible camp. And one day there was a revolution from those gypsies. The police came on their horses and they threw themselves at the horses and got into the kitchen. And from that day on, the soups were a little bit thicker. She goes on to say, the gypsies, I saw one, they used to catch those rats and slice them in the belly. They used to take a tin can and water from the ocean and have a little barbecue. And Jewish people would get their little driftwood thing and go into the ocean to catch a little sardine. When you're hungry, you know what you can do. Um, so I've shown, or hope to have shown, that um, overall, though some Jewish testimonies from French camps mention perceptions and interactions with Roma prisoners, those mentions are often filtered through stereotypes of and prejudices against Roma people. Um, I thought it could maybe be interesting to examine how French Jews who were then deported from French camps to Auschwitz perceived the Roma prisoners there, and whether there were many differences um, with their perceptions of Roma in France. Roma and Sinti families were detained in a separate part of Auschwitz, the Tigoiner Lager, um, but it's important to note that these families were mainly deported from Germany, Austria, the protectorate of Boravia and Moravia, and Poland, and not France. The main difference that emerges between conversations on Auschwitz and those on French camps is that interviewers very often actually directly ask questions about Roma prisoners, usually something along the lines of, what about the gypsies? If not directly asked, Jewish interviewees often bring up the fate of Roma prisoners in Auschwitz at the end of their interviews when asking, when asked if they had anything else to add. Many said, I quote, the gypsies also suffered, or the gypsies suffered like us. This kind of makes it seem like they wanted to correct the historical record and emphasize the need to remember the Roma. A man named Sylvain Samuel Suchowalski in his testimony said, I quote, we speak a lot of Jews who suffered a lot, all of us in the Shoah, but we don't speak enough of the Tsigan who suffered immensely. So why um, is there more emphasis in these interviews on Roma in Auschwitz as opposed to Roma in French camps? This is most likely because the persecution and the uh, murder of Roma in Auschwitz was already quite a well-known phenomenon in the 1990s when the interviews were being carried out, especially due to this event of the um, liquidation of the Roma camp, the Siegwerner Lager. The destruction of the Roma camp in Auschwitz, which took place on August 2nd, 1944, where the entire population of the camp, approximately 4,000 people, was brought to the gas chambers and murdered, is an event that is frequently mentioned in testimonies from French Jews, and something that seems to have sensitized many of them to the need to remember the genocide of the Roma. Interviews often mention the shock they felt from seeing the contrast between the perceived liveliness of the Roma camp to then the eerie quiet after it had been emptied out. A man named Gabriel Benichou in his testimony said, I quote, the Tsigan were there as families, whole families. They had their things with them, their instruments, and Sunday mornings we could hear them play. I don't know if they were playing mass or making concerts, but we would sit in the corner and listen to them. For us, it was wonderful, extraordinary. It lasted some time, but then one day in August 1943, they were all brought to the gas chambers. Many interviewees said they feared that their section of the camp would be next to be liquidated. The fact that Roma families remained together also seemed to have an impact on many French Jewish survivors. In her testimony, um, Janine Guillemont said, I quote, what I forgot to add was that the Tigan also suffered, the gypsies. At first we saw their camp with the families, the father, the mother, the children. And when we looked at them, we told ourselves they were lucky, they were together with their whole family. But one night we heard screams and cries, and the next day there was nothing left. 
that was a Tidane camp. Um, however, many testimonies from French Jews who were in Auschwitz also carry on some of these prejudicial views that I outlined earlier when discussing French camps. Um, some interviewees perceived Roma prisoners as somehow more used to suffering and expressed pity for them that in itself was a way, was in itself very shaped by xenophobic views. Um, for example, when asked by the interviewer if Roma in the camp um, were worse off than Jews in Auschwitz, a woman named Edda Bloom said, I quote, yes, with the Jews at least there were some who knew how to write, those who knew how to play were called to be in the orchestra, so the Jews were a little bit better off than the gypsies, because they were good for nothing, you understand? They were good at fighting and dying, that's all. They didn't know how to do anything for them except to die. So, um, some thoughts to wrap this up. I hope to have highlighted the importance of studying the experiences of Jews and Roma together as entangled and not parallel or separate, because they lived through a similar process of imprisonment in the same camps. In some cases, they shared experiences of deportation to camps in the East, though not all on the same scale in terms of numbers. And there is no question that many, many more Jews were imprisoned and deported than Roma in France. I hope to have shown how the stories of two persecuted groups can maybe be told in a way that does not place these groups into a hierarchy of suffering um, and that focuses instead on mutual perceptions and interactions between them. Beyond seeing the very experiences of Jews and Roma in France as entangled at the time, I hope to have also demonstrated that at times, researching these experiences becomes inevitably entangled as a limitation on sources means that in some cases, and especially with the VHA, we can only uncover clues of Rome experiences in French camps filtered through the lens of Jewish testimony. I hope to have provided some thoughts on how to work with an archive that doesn't at a first glance seem to contain many sources on Roma as a marginalized group and has much more of an emphasis on Jewish experiences as is the case for many Holocaust archives. Um, I've also outlined some of the challenges when working with testimonies as a source and how much these interviews and the information we gain from them are shaped by the push and pull of what the interviewer says, asks, and what the survivor wants to focus on. Sections of Jewish testimonies on Auschwitz where interviewers explicitly ask, what about the gypsies, inevitably contain more details of Roma experiences and conversations on French camps where no questions are asked about Roma prisoners. Finally, I hope that Illuminating the challenges and issues faced using this entangled approach shows that nothing can ever really replace a testimony given directly by a survivor of a certain group to tell the story of that group's experience, especially one from a community whose history of persecution has so often been marginalized, as is the case for the Roma in France and Europe more broadly. I want to highlight again the importance of recent and ongoing testimony collection projects of Roma experiences of persecution. Though Jewish testimonies can provide a way into examining the experiences of Roma in France, without the actual voices of those persecuted for being Roma, we can only reconstruct a history that is partial and potentially distorted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. That was amazing. So can you stop sharing your screen? And now we will turn to discussion and questions. For those of you on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom um, of your window. And please be aware the lecture is being recorded and we're going to spread it all over the world. So um, <laughs> if you want to ask your question anonymously, you do have an option to do that. Um, so I'll let you call on people. Yeah. Um, I'll also say please speak up um, uh, because we are using kind of the, the mics. Um, first, thank you so much for your presentation. I thought it was quite interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions, but the main two that I wanted to ask was they're both related um, to the Astana. Um, and my first question was you you emphasize that his age influenced how he gave his testimony and you describe it as disorganized. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your methodology in analyzing this testimony. And I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about his experience in the camps as a child after his mom was deported. And if he then had to connect to another family or how that influenced his experience 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. That was really great. Um, about methodology, um, so yes, the testimony is disorganized and the stories aren't always told in a linear way. I, my main methodology was that I listened to his entire testimony start to finish, and that enables you to kind of piece together what happened because the main challenge is that he jumps back and forth from different time periods and different memories. But if you, and so if you only watch the section that talks about his experience in the camps, it might be quite confusing. But just watching the entire thing the whole way through, and you can kind of piece together um, what happened. And then I also brought my own knowledge of um, different population transfers that happened between the camps of Roma populations um, to try and piece together a timeline a bit more because he doesn't really use many dates. Um, in terms of his experience in the camp, so from what he says in his testimony, his mother and the rest of his family was deported, well, taken away from the camps, and he was supposed to go with them, but a different family kind of held him back and said, no, no, stay with us, like, where they're going, you shouldn't be going. And then it's a little bit unclear what exactly, ha or how exactly he managed to survive through all these different camps. It seems that he was taken to a different French internment camp with other children. And then somehow, he doesn't even seem entirely clear on how it even happened. I mean, he was four or five years old at the time, was taken to these different concentration camps. His memories of the camps themselves are a lot more detailed and vivid. I think, I mean, I think a lot of it is because they're so traumatic and, and you know, hard to not remember. Um, but then what is kind of missing is this detail between how he went from camp to camp. But I also think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that like he didn't have any agency over where he was being transferred. Um, so that kind of thing is hard to remember if you're a child. Thank you so much, Clara. Uh, two questions. So my first one is sort of thinking about the time period that you laid out. Uh, so 1939-40 to 1946. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the post-war um, and what you're hoping to focus on. And then my second one, because you know, you, you're working with testimonies, you're thinking about this, how much is that like memory and the, the creation of memory going to play um, in the bigger project? And so thinking not only about the entanglement within the testimonies between the Jewish survivors, but the entanglement between the interviewers and the survivors, and sort of then even considering the you know the French government not recognizing it in 2016, like how much does that play into the conversations that you're having about this history? Okay, thank you so much for your questions. I would say those are actually quite linked together, and I'll try and explain um, how I see that. Um, so about the timeline and the post-war period, um, yeah, it's obviously a very conscious choice to extend the study of this um, until 1946, because, like I mentioned briefly, um, the imprisonment of Roma families continued after the end of the Nazi occupation and the war, and that is something that is really not talked about enough in the histori historiography and also just in schools and education generally. Um, I am hoping to be able to focus on that period. It's a part of my research I haven't fully gotten to yet and I haven't fully really understood how I'm going to integrate it. I think that that ties into your second question about memory and I do think that I want to um, address the fact that this time period is so understudied because people choose not to remember it in French um, education and historiography. And um, I think what's probably going to happen in my final thesis, whenever it ends up being written, um, is that there will be kind of an epilogue chapter on what that like 1944 to 46 period looked like. Ideally, I would love to be able to trace the paths of different families um, through until that end period, but like I said, it's quite hard with different, like the lack of historical record. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really fascinating and intrigued by everything you said. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more, oh, that's panning, that's great. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could speak a little more about the, the family aspect of it, just because when I have, like, my, you know, imagination of the arrival at Auschwitz, it's a, like, violent, dissolution of the family unit. Um, and so w why were the the Roma population at Auschwitz with their families, and why are you focusing on families in particular in terms of the French internment camps? That's a great question. Thank you so much. It's um, one of the main discussions I've been having with my supervisor recently about the focus of the entire project and why I think the family um, matters. I would say, that, again, the two parts of your question are quite linked. I think it's 
um, very interesting that when historians talk about Roma in Auschwitz, they focus so much on the fact that they were interned as families. And I, the path of my reasoning was I um, wanted to question that and question this narrative of um, the fact that some people have said that um, Roma were better off because they were interned with their families. And from that starting point, I want to start questioning well, why do we think that being with your family in that kind of situation would be necessarily something that would give people strength and hope? Um, and I, I wanted to extend that to the situation of French camps because um, there is, in some of the literature, a narrative that Roma families were somehow, because they were together in so, you know, such large families, um, they were somehow more resilient and better, quote unquote, prepared for internment. And I found that very hard to read and wanted to question that a little bit more. Um, and I also wanted to question that because in the camps I'm speaking about, um, not, not in all camps, but in the camps where Jews and Roma were interned, um, in the same camp, Jewish families were also still together and were not separated by gender. Um, and so I wanted to kind of question, why don't we really think about the fact that those families remain together? Why is the narrative always so much more in Roma families remain together? Um, and I kind of wanted to, again, this ties in with the entanglement of experience and what the family really meant in the camp. I hope that's answered your question. Um, hi, uh, I have a, a question from uh, Mark, Wils uh, Mark Wilson from Innovate UK. Um, and Mark asks, uh, thank you, Clara, for an interesting talk. To what extent have you cross-referenced oral history sources with archival sources? to construct these histories of uh, Roma experience. Um, do you face the same challenges of limited source material? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the last month here at the Shell Foundation was really my first time properly like digging deep into, all, uh, into testimony as a source. Um, so all these questions of how to cross-reference with archival material are starting to come into my mind, and I spoke about it a little bit when talking about um, Ziget and Ash's history. I do think that, yes, in an ideal world, we would be able to listen to a testimony, then go into archives, be able to exactly retrace all the steps of these individuals and families, but like I said, there are a lot of archival gaps and limitations that make this sometimes difficult, um, and I do think that at times it can be maybe a bit dangerous to get into narratives of like verification of what is being said in a testimony, um, especially, again, because of the case of French Roma, there are these gaps in the information available. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jana, for this uh, great talk. Um, I want to talk about sources, too. So uh, um, you showed this uh, screenshot with the uh, photograph which the survivor both, uh, up in, uh, was holding up in, at the end of the interview. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the story of the photograph? Um, is this photograph known? Or is it, was it, is it totally new just because he had the cell in the car? Um, and I'm asking this because um, uh, I'm, the center is part of a project uh, collecting photographs of mass deportations of Jews, but also Roma. And we had the problem that, for example, we have only practically like, one documentation of a Roma deportation, while we have almost 55 from a uh, Jewish deportation. Mm -hmm. While the numbers are different, there's still a lack of kind of uh, visual evidence. And so I wonder how does this play into your kind of uh, work? How much are you using visual evidence? And uh, do you see a similar discrepancy between, let's say, kind of sources of like Jews in Can German camps in France and Roma? Thank you for your question. Um, so first, on the photograph that um, Tiga shows in the interview, I'd never seen that photograph before, and I don't think it's one that is widely like used in um, research on this topic. I don't, sadly, don't know the story of the photograph. I don't know how he had it or how who took it or any of that. Um, I would love to know more, and we'll definitely think about maybe how that could be traced. Um, in terms of photographs more generally on this topic, there are um, strangely a lot of photographs um, of Roma children, Roma families in particular camps. Um, in the camp of Rivesalt that I mentioned before in the south of France, um, there was a nurse who worked there and she took um, maybe 50 or 100 photos um, of that 
like children in the camp mostly because I think she was caring for children, but a lot of um, families as well. And I think that's probably the biggest amount of visual sources we have on this topic. I don't think there are really any other um, photos of deportations, but mostly because I said that is still very much a very, well, A, like it was quite an isolated um, incident and also there just isn't a lot of research on um, that yet. It's ongoing and still developing, so maybe we'll uncover some more, hopefully. Um, in terms of visual evidence in my work more generally, it's not something I really um, focused on a lot. My focus mainly has been more on ego documents, and I started this project with a really big focus on um, letters written by Jews in camps, and then wanted to expand it um, to try and look at different forms of like what sources we can find to use that use the voices of those persecuted. Um, that in itself is a challenge when looking at Jews in Roma because um, there is again a source disparity there. I was looking at a lot of um, letters sent from the camp of Tansi and. Those letters um, were sent out of the camp to families and have generally been preserved because families kept them and then donated them to the Shoah Foundation Archive in Paris. I haven't found a similar collection of private correspondence for um, Roma families. I have found um, not private correspondence, but letters written by Roma in a lot of the camps that I mentioned to the authorities trying to petition for their liberation, which is obviously a very different type of source than like a personal family letter, but I think still allows for some interesting analysis of agency and what kind of um, networks Roma families still had outside of the camps. Yeah, um, I have a question from Madeline White. Uh, a wonderful talk. Um, did you see any indications that the increased recollection of the Roma in the context of Auschwitz may also have been caused by a changing perspective of shared nationality? Thinking along the lines of in France, the, the Roma were more likely interpreted as other, whereas when moved from the local context, the origins in France made them a more familiar entity. Do Jewish and Roma histories become more entangled farther from home? That's a great question. Thank you, Madeline. Um, that is something I was thinking of when writing this talk. Um, again, just as a caveat, the research on researching Roma in Auschwitz and Jews in Auschwitz is not really a main focus of my research. I um, mostly got into that while being at the Shoah Foundation and just kind of thinking about all these questions that testimonies raised. I do, it is something I have wondered about whether French Jews um, perceived Roma in France and maybe had more stereotypes about them kind of bubbling in their lives and in society and whether that maybe shaped more prejudice and then the fact of being abroad in a concentration camp maybe did shift that quite a lot. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something I'm thinking about. Um, yes, it's probably not so like, really close to your topic. I know it's not the topic of your uh, presentation, but uh, just talking about the medical history of Jewish Roma. And you mentioned that uh, Jews in French camp, they uh, consider the Jews sometimes uh, kind of, it's not more fair that they are uh, on the same condition as Roma. But when just talking about kind of legal basis of deportation um, and uh, uh, discrimination against Jews in Roma, I know that especially in Vichy France, um, so like a, there is like kind of explanation for the fact to just to uh, deport uh, non citizen Jews and uh, like we try to save our own Jews, like how it was like regarding regarding Roma, uh, what was the like, explanation uh, they were considered as citizens or not citizens, or uh, like, just all Romas with a different that's a really fantastic question. Um, I would say there's multiple potential explanations and no one clear explanation. Um, a few things. First of all, I think the fact that um, the French state actually was the instigator of persecution against Roma, and like I said, that started a lot before the war, meant that generally any issues with their internment and imprisonment was much more left to the French state to handle than the Nazi occupying authorities. Um, in a lot of cases, though the order to imprison Roma was originally given by the Nazis. Um, they didn't want to give any money to make these camps actually function or put into place, and a lot of that was left to the French government. So I would say that part of the explanation is that it, the issue was kind of delegated to the French state, which did not end up 
deporting um, like in a lar on a large scale its Roma population. In terms of citizenship, I mentioned that um, a lot or most of the Roma in these camps were French citizens, um, but I would say that generally they were not perceived as such by the administration. That didn't lead to any concrete policies, but in these letters I was speaking of when they, a lot of Roma families are petitioning for their freedom, um, a lot of them draw on this kind of rhetoric of Frenchness and the fact that they'd been in France for generations, and that doesn't really seem to ever have been something that was acknowledged by the authorities. Just picking up on this discussion, I think there are a lot of parallels uh, actually with Jewish positions, not just in France but all over Europe, using the same or, or similar arguments, uh, being part, uh, so to speak, uh, citizens, taxpayers, um, and peasants. And so it's interesting to uh, compare the, uh, these uh, petitions to also Jewish petitions. We have another kind of uh, side of entanglement there. Yeah, de definitely. And also, just I'm just thinking of something to follow up on um, both comments and questions. I, I've also, in a lot of the literature, literature um, there's this idea that the French state wanted to kind of assimilate Roma back into French society, and that internment was a kind of way of trying to survey and change their behavior. And that rhetoric was not the same as the reasons behind the internment of Jews, which was much more a rejection and less the kind of maybe one day they could be assimilated back. Which is one more thing I had to say. Yeah. I have a question from Rachel. Um, do you know how many Roma survivors are still living? And if you had the opportunity to interview a Roma survivor now, what would you ask? And then thank you. This is a wonderful question. That's an amazing question. Um, so this testimony collection project that I mentioned in France that happened a few years ago, um, that is a fantastic project. It's run by Ilsen Abou at the USS in France um, and is soon going to be um, available in the French National Archives. Just want to say that for anyone who's interested other than me. Um, there are survivors still alive. I think this testimony collection project also interviewed descendants of survivors because Obviously, like in contrast to, for example, the Shaw Foundation's testimony collection project in the mid to late 90s, where a lot of survivors were um, still around, that were kind of running out of time. Um, so I think that expanding testimony collection to family members and descendants who would have heard stories is also just a really interesting project and like something to think about methodologically. Um, if I had the chance, I absolutely would. Um, God, what question? There's so many questions. Um, I think I think a lot of my questions would be, a, well, first of all, about this kind of notion of family within the camp and how that maybe was altered or shifted by the experience of imprisonment. Um, I would probably want to ask some questions about how survivors feel, questions about memory, how survivors feel existing in a French society under a French state, which still is reluctant to acknowledge the suffering. Um, a lot of Roma survivors were never actually acknowledged as survivors and were um, given these identification cards after the war that ascribed them as political um, deportees or political protesters, and which obviously was not the case. Um, so yeah, that would be my other question. Any other questions? All right, well, let's conclude by thanking Clara. <laughs> and the next event organized by the Center is on Indigenous Peoples Day, October 9th. Um, and it's about uh, Indigenous Maori um, history in New Zealand. We hope you join us and um, also subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find the whole archive of past lectures and events. So thank you again, Clara. Thank you.